Hi, everyone. So welcome to the live stream today. It is the final session on our discussion for the consolidated financial statement in relation to the ICA November 2021 examination. And we want to continue with the discussion and look at the various things that we need to consider. So far, we've looked at the consolidated financial statement, discussed the various things that we need to look out for when it comes to dealing with consolidated financial statements. And we want to look at the final aspect, dealing with intra-group trading, and then calculating the non-controlling interest figure at the reporting date, and also looking at the um, group retained earnings at the reporting date and all that, and seeing how all those things knit together in that case. And I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. This is a part four in our discussion. In case you missed the part one, the part two, and the part three, you can check the description of this video on YouTube, and you'll be able to get the links to the individual videos and watch them. Or you can also check our playlist titled group financial statements on the channel and you'll be able to get access to all of these videos and watch remember consolidated financial statement is one of the key questions that will be in corporate reporting and financial reporting usually that's going to be question one but like i say all the time you want to make sure that you uh resist the temptation of solving that first but doing that as your last or the, your last but one question in the exam hall in that case so we want to continue with it and then look at exactly what we need to do let me bring up my screen my discussion real quick let's make it more bigger than that so so far we've looked at the various key workings that we need to look out for yesterday we concluded on how we calculate goodwill and you saw that we bring the fair value of consideration uh, transferred. We saw that we will bring uh, the NCI and we saw the various ways through which NCI is calculated. And then the fair value of consideration transferred is also calculated. If you remember, one of the key statements we made was that in the calculation of the goodwill, it is likely that the goodwill figure will be negative. Now, when there is a negative goodwill, we said that that negative goodwill is treated as profit on acquisition. And if we are preparing the consolidated statement of profit or loss, that will be added to other income. But when we are preparing the consolidated statement of financial position, that will be added to the group retained earnings or the consolidated retained earnings. And we saw uh, some various standards that actually will be coming to play, like IAS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities, contingent assets, as well as IFRS 9 financial instruments and how they are treated in the entities books or on the face of the consolidated financial statement. What we want to look at uh, today generally is to look at the intra-group trading. One of the key areas that uh, we need to look out for almost always every consolidated financial statement, there is going to be intra-group trading and we want to find out how we eliminate that. Now, when dealing with consolidated financial statement, the principle is that all intra-group trading transactions must be removed or eliminated on the face of the consolidated financial statement. All intra-group transactions must be removed or eliminated on the face of the consolidated financial statement. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, the parent is not supposed to sell to the sub. The sub is not supposed to sell to the parent. The parent is not supposed to owe the sub. The sub is not supposed to owe the parent. So any amount that is outstanding at the reporting date between the related parties between the parent and the subsidiary or the subsidiary and the parent, it has to be eliminated on the face of the consolidated financial statement. Whether we are preparing the consolidated statement of profit or loss or the consolidated statement of financial position. But two things that we must know broadly when it comes to dealing with a consolidated financial statement. The first, uh, when it comes to dealing with intra-group trading, the first one is inventory. Now, there could be sale of inventories between the parent and the sub where the parent is the one selling to the sub and the sub is the one selling to the parent. And we must know how to deal with this particular aspect in that case. Then, if there is disposal of assets also, we must look at how we account for these generally at the end of the day. So let's look at inventory first and let's deal with that. Inventory. Inventory. Now, when it comes to dealing with inventories, 
what is going to be happening is that if the parents sold to the subsidiary, whatever they sold to them really is not a big deal. But uh, two things are going to be happening when it comes to dealing with inventories. Number one is that total sales value of inventory shall be eliminated on consolidation. Total sales value shall be eliminated on consolidation. What does that mean? It means that the total sales that occurred between the parent and the sub shall be eliminated in it. Now, remember, on the consolidated financial statement, it, let's say the parent is the one selling, the parent is going to be selling, the subsidiary is going to be selling. So what happens is that the sales figure would have to be eliminated from the consolidated financial statement. How do we eliminate it? We eliminate it by deducting it from the sales figure or the revenue. So we debit revenue. Remember, revenue keeps a credit balance. So when you are debiting revenue, it means you are deducting it. Then cost of sales is an expenses also keeps a credit uh, a debit balance but then we're going to credit cost of sales so that's the first thing you must understand now we do this when we are preparing the consolidated statement of profit or loss the consolidated statement of profit or loss if you are preparing the consolidated statement of profit or loss number 1 the total sales value of inventory during the post acquisition period shall be deducted from the uh, sale revenue, sales revenue or sales or revenue and shall be deducted from cost of sales. That is the first thing we must be aware of. That is the first thing we must know about. But then what happens is that at the reporting date, it is likely that the one who bought the goods, be the parent on the sub, there is going to be uh, unsold inventories or even goods in transit. So the second thing, the number two, is that there will be provision for unrealized profit. Now, why the concept of provision for unrealized profit? Because even though the transaction has taken place, on the group level, the sales has not been done. Okay? Even though the transaction has taken place on the group level the sales has not occurred so it means that let's say p is the parents and they sell to say y okay B is the parent and they sell to Y. All right? If they sell to Y and during the year, at the reporting date, uh, Y has some of the inventories in stock. So if uh, they have some of the inventories in stock, then on the consolidated level, the inventory is being accounted for higher. Because remember, in accordance with IAS2 inventories, Inventory shall be carried at what? Lower of cost and net realizable value. So whilst P has sold those goods, it is no longer in their inventory. But in the books of Y, that inventory is included in their closing inventory. But it is included not at the cost of the revenue, but at the cost of the rev uh, not at the cost of the inventory, but at the cost with the profits that P put on it while selling to Y. For that reason, it means inventory is being what? Overstated as per IAS2 because we have to carry inventory at lower of cost or net realizable value. For that reason, we have to calculate what is called provision for unrealized profit. Does it make sense? 
Does it make sense? So remember I told you, I, I keep on telling you this. You don't, don't just learn something. Don't just chew baba about the fact that I need to calculate provision for realized profit. You must know the brain behind it, the principle behind it, why you are doing that. When you know the principle, the brain, the, the, the standard behind it, it becomes more easier and you flow naturally when doing it. So the reason why we are calculating the provision for realized profit is that the inventories included in the books of the purchasing entity will be valued above its uh, cost. For that reason, that profit must be eliminated in the books. And that is what provision for realized profit is about. Now, generally, provision for realized profit will be calculated on two things. One goods in transit and then two closing inventories at a reporting date now that sounds a bit counterintuitive but i'm going to explain it so let's say for instance at a reporting date why who is the one buying the goods has in as part of its inventory, an amount of, say, 10000 So the total inventory is 10000 But part of this 10000 inventory, they bought 2000 from P. Okay? So what it means is that this on this 2000 we have to calculate provision for realized profit. However, before the end of the year, P has sent another good, goods. Now, what happens is that those goods in transit... It's not, they've not received them yet. So what will happen is that we are going to uh, recognize their goods in transit into the financial statement of the entity that actually sold or that is selling the goods. So goods in transit is simply going to be added to the inventory, to the closing inventory. Now, when you add it to the closing inventory, then what happens is that you are going to be calculating provision for unrealized profit. You are going to be calculating provision for unrealized profit. So the provision for unrealized profit relating to inventories can be computed on the closing inventory in stock and then any goods in transit that is yet to be received by the selling entity. But remember, the brain behind the, this computation is that when that closing inventory is in the books of the buyer, it is overstated. For that reason, what is going to be happening is that we would have to account for it in accordance with IAS2 by strapping that provision from it. But question we ask ourselves is, if we calculate the provision for realized profit, what is the double entry for the provision for realized profit? It's simple. We're going to be debiting retained earnings. Okay, and then credit inventory. Remember, inventory keeps a, credit, a debit balance. So when we say you credit inventory, it means you deduct the provision for realized profit from the inventory figure. You deduct the provision for realized profit from the inventory figure. Now, when we say you debit retained earnings, it means you deduct it from the profit of the one selling it. Stay with me carefully here. You deduct the provision for realized profit from the accounts of the one selling. That is why I told you when we were doing goodwill that assuming the subsidiary is the one selling the goods, then any provision for realized profit will be deducted from the post-acquisition profit of the subsidiary. But if it is the parent selling to the subsidiary, then any provision for realized profit is deducted from the group retained earnings. The net effect at the end of the day is that it is going to be what? Deducted from the group retained earnings or the retained earnings of the entity selling. Or alternatively, it could also be added to cost of sales. It's the same thing. We could debit cost of sales. So that provision for realized profit can be added to cost of sales. Note, it will be added to the cost of sales if we are preparing the st consolidated statement of profit or loss. So if you are preparing the consolidated statement of profit or loss, then the provision for realized profit shall be calculated or, or shall be added to the cost of sales, shall be added to the cost of sales. So that is the idea about 
provision for unrealized profit. So when it comes to inventories, one, total sales must be eliminated. Two, any inventory outstanding at the reporting date, we have to note that it is being overstated as per IAS2. For that reason, we have to calculate the provision for unrealized profit, and that provision for unrealized profit must be adjusted for in the profit or in the financial statement, both in the PL account and in the statement of financial position. Any questions about inventories? Any questions about inventories? Let me know if you have any questions for me real quick. See some comments coming in. Let's see if I can take them up. Muntadi said, hi, Inshira. Hello, Muntadi. Vincent said, good evening, Inshira. Um, I am so happy to join in with you today. I love so much of this topic. Wow, that's awesome. Irene Labi said, hello. Good afternoon, Inshira. Good afternoon, Irene. Hope you're doing well. Uh, next one, Isa. Abdo said, Inshira Basa Pa. <laughs> Why, Abdo, you don't like Basa? Uh, Osmanu said, Hi, Inshira, good evening. I just joined. Yeah, Osmanu, you're welcome. Isa said, Good evening. Good evening, uh, Isa. Stan Obi said, What if the inventory is not sold? How is it treated? I don't understand your question. Stan Obi, I don't understand your question. The reason why we are calculating this provision for realized profit is that. The goods has been sold to the entity, to Y, say the subsidiary Y, but they've not sold it yet. It is still part of their inventory. That is why we are calculating the provision for realized profit. They've not sold what we sold to them. Assuming they've sold what we sold to them, that one is not a noose. There will not be any provision for realized profit. But if they had not sold what we have sold to them, that is where the provision for realized profit comes in. So, Stan Obi, let me know if that makes sense for you in that case. Let me know if that makes sense for you. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video when you join. Most importantly, comment in the chat box any questions that you have for me in that case as we uh, continue with the discussion. Okay, so Stan Obi said, okay, all right, that's fine. Idris Abbas said, good evening, Inshira. Good evening, Idris. Idrisu, not Idris. <laughs> Idrisu, thanks for joining us. Right. So now that we've dealt with inventory, let's look at disposal of assets. Disposal of assets. Now, when there is a disposal of assets, the question is that the asset has not been sold, literally. Because, you see, on the group level, the two shall be one. So if we have P and Y, on the group level, the two shall be one. Okay? So when we are looking at P and Y together, it is a single firm. It's a single firm. That's why we are preparing a consolidated financial statement for a single firm in that particular case. So it is a single firm. For that reason, since P and Y are treated as a single firm, then it means that when P sells an asset to Y, on the group level, the asset is being used still by the group. For that reason... Anytime there is disposal of an asset, there has to be provision for unrealized profit. So the provision for unrealized profit here is simply going to be the fair value at which the asset was sold minus the carrying amount at which the asset was before it was sold. Note that provision for unrealized profit can be a loss in the case of the issue about disposal of assets so if the entity selling it made a loss then we have to go and adjust it in the financial statement we have to go and adjust it in the financial statement so when there is provision for realized profit on disposal of assets basically what you do is that you simply debit 
the retained earnings of whoever is selling because they have not made that profit yet. Okay? Then you credit property, plants, and equipment. You got to be careful about this very well. Here, I am assuming that the fair value of the asset was greater than the carrying amount. So if the fair value of the asset was greater than carrying amount, the reason why you are crediting PPE is that it means on the group level, the asset is being overstated. The asset is being overstated for that provision for unrealized profit. So let's make sense of what is going on. Let's make sense of what is going on. So P sells to Y an asset. Okay. Let's say that the dates that they are selling, the current amount of the asset was, say, 42000 And then the fair value at which they sold the asset was, say, 50000 What it means is that there is a profit they have recognized. Okay, P has recognized in their books as how much? $8,000. This $8,000 is what we are referring to as provision for realized profit. Like I said, even though in their individual books, P may have seen as making this profit, on the consolidated level, the asset is still being used by the entity because the two shall be one. P and Y is a single entity. So this 8,000, what do we do? Since P recognized this 18,000 in their profit for the year, it means it was included in their retained earnings. So what do we do? We deduct it from retained earnings. That's why we are debiting retained earnings with the 8,000 to remove that profit because the, on the group level, the two shall be one. Then what it means is that on the group level, the assets should be carried at how much? 42,000. But right now, on the group level, the asset is being carried at 50000 What happens then? It means the asset is being carried over its amount that is supposed to be carried. For that reason, we credit property, plants, and equipment on the face of the consolidated financial statement, $8,000. Does it make sense? $8,000. Now, get a catch. That's the first part. Because... The subsidiary bought the asset at 50,000, they would depreciate the asset at 50,000. Which means, because of the profit that has been made, they would charge more depreciation than they should have charged. Listen carefully. So, on top of the provision for realized profit, there is going to be an excess depreciation. There is going to be an excess depreciation because they will calculate depreciation using 50,000, the value at which they bought it, and not the 42,000, the value from the group perspective in that particular case. The value from the group perspective in that particular case. So this excess depreciation is simply going to be the uh, provision for realized profit figure divided by the economic life of the asset times X over 12 if it is less than one year in that particular case are you getting the treatment here this is what we do when there is a disposal of an asset now i'm seeing a question from osmanu saying that what if the sale is made by the subsidiary is the same thing we're going to be making if the sale is made by the subsidiary so assuming that y is the one selling so let me put it up this time around y is selling to p the same thing happens. Let's say the current amount is whatever, 20000 but they sold it to them at, say, 24000 which means there is a profit on disposal they have made of 4000 On the group level, you can't make a profit like that because the asset is still in the group. So that 4000 becomes the provision for realized profit. Who is selling here? It is the subsidiary. So we we'll debit the subsidiary's profit for the year. Okay? So we debit the subsidiary's profit for the year. We deduct it from the profit for the year of the subsidiary since the subsidiary is the one selling. But you still got to credit property, plant, and equipment on the face of the consolidated statement of financial position because the asset is being overstated. 
then it means that the entity listen carefully it means that the parent entity will charge depreciation on the twenty four thousand. so that additional depreciation they are charging due to the sale would have to also be reversed in the books of the entity in that particular case would have to be reversed in the books of the entity in that particular case so that is what you see in the excess depreciation so with the excess depreciation whoever bought the asset who uh going to debit pp so you're going to add that back to pp and then you credit the retained earnings or the profit for the year because they've charged more depreciation than they are supposed to charge so you add it back to the retained earnings for the entity then you debit pp in that case any questions please do you understand any questions please see some comments coming in let's see if i can pick them up as they relate to the discussion real quick um idris who said the network is bad here i'll say oh sorry about that use a better network come on now check the networks what do we have i think we have mtn we have vodafone airtel tigo i mean try all of them and see probably one of them will be better wherever you are at a buzz try bini piri said good evening sir more grace in jesus name amen more thank you for joining us gloria jones said hi sir glad to join today gloria from australia okay gloria thank you for joining us give us a thumbs up on the video and i hope that you are getting some value already Osmanu oh, said, okay, that was what I took earlier. Um, Chimuka, Chimu, Chimuka, Chimuka said, hi there, glad to be here. Your lectures are really helpful. Thank you, Chimuka. Uh, Montadi said, what if they just exchange assets? What is the treatment? Okay, that's a good one. If they, if they exchange assets, it, it's still going to be a disposal at the end of the day. So whoever is making a gain, okay, would have to be reversed. Because the principle, Montadi, the principle is that whatever that is happening, whatever that is happening on the consolidated level, we must eliminate the transaction that occurred. So if they exchange an asset, they would have to find out on the consolidated level, is the asset value going up? Then we have to reverse it. Then is the asset value coming down? Then we reverse it. So maybe let me bring up the slide and then let's look at uh, some illustration. So let's say that P is on one side, Y is on the other side. So let's say that P has an asset, the carrying amount of that asset in their books will say 40000 Okay, $40,000. And then uh, Y has an asset, the carrying amount is, say, uh, 32000 Then, whilst they were exchanging, they concluded that the asset of Y had a fair value at the time of the disposal, or at the time of the exchange, the fair value was whatever, let's say 40000 So, at the end of the day, they exchanged their 40000 asset for the 40,000 asset from the P. Now, if you look at it, you realize that there is some element of revaluation coming in there, but that is not a revaluation. It's, it's a fair value gain. It means on the exchange, they are making a profit of how much? 8,000. So whatever profit that is being made on uh, the, whatever profit that is being made on the exchange would have to be reversed. Then if the exchange results into more depreciation being charged by another entity and less depreciation being charged at, at another, we will reverse all those things. We reverse it. So whatever that is happening, all you are asking yourself is, on the consolidated level, is the asset value going up or coming down? If the asset value is going up on the consolidated level, then you got to reverse it. Then if the asset value goes up, it means the entity receiving the asset might have charged or will charge 
more depreciation than they should have charged. So the excess depreciation will also have to be what? Reversed in the books of the account as well as on the face of the statement of financial position relating to the PPE. So that is the issue about that. Muntadi Leonard, let me know if that makes sense for you. Osumano said, okay, all right. I hope you got that. So that is the idea about dealing with the inventory aspect in that particular case. That's the idea about dealing with the inventory aspect in that case. Now, okay, so Muntadi said, wow, awesome. Okay, that's good. Means you understand. I see some of you guys joining. Come on now. You are welcome uh, to the live stream. This is section four in our discussion on consolidated financial statement. And as a matter of fact, the final session on consolidated financial statement for the ICA November 2021 examination. Now, in case you missed one, two, three, don't worry. You can check the description of this video on YouTube and you can watch the videos one after the other or just check the playlist group financial statements and you'll be able to get access to all of the videos and watch them remember it is about understanding all of these steps all of these pieces that guides you in order for you to prepare well for the examination and solve the consolidated financial statement questions however no matter how excited you are about consolidated financial statements please do not answer that as your first question as your second question, or even as your third question. Let that be your last or last but one question in the exam hall because of the fact that there are other easy areas that you can get marks from rather than looking at the consolidated financial statement. And remember to give us a thumbs up on the video. It helps us a lot, makes the video more engaging, and YouTube will be able to push the video so we can reach as many students as possible and build this community so we can as, uh, really as, uh, together help a lot of people. And subscribe to the channel in case you have not done that already, but click the bell notification icon. When I release new content, you will be notified by YouTube. So let's go. The second part of intra-group trading is that there has to be what is called reconciliation of current accounts. Reconciliation of current accounts. Now, when we say reconciliation of current accounts, what the heck do we mean? We mean that we are... Remember I told you in the beginning that... Uh, the parent is not supposed to owe the subsidiary, and the subsidiary is not supposed to owe the parent. In other words, there will be trade payables in the books of the one buying, and then trade receivables in the books of the one selling. What we want to do is we want to eliminate, we want to remove those trade payables in the consolidated financial statement. So how do we remove the trade payables? So let me give you an example. So we have the parent on one side, we have the subsidiary on the other side. I am assuming that, okay, for, for the purpose of my illustration, and when you flip it up, it's the same thing, okay? So don't worry whether the parent is selling or the sub is selling, just understand the principle. So I'm going to assume here that the subsidiary is selling to the parent. So what happens is that since the parent is the one buying, they will be having trade receivables. So included in the trade receivables of the parent will be how much they owe the subsidiary. Then in the books of the subsidiary, we're going to be having trade payables. Okay? Trade payables. Because, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Let me take that again. The parent is the one buying, so they will have receivable, they will have payables rather. Sorry about that. And then the subsidiary is the one selling, so they will have receivables. Let's take that again. I'm assuming that the parent is buying from the sub, okay? The parent is buying from the sub. So if the parent is buying from the sub, then the parent will owe the subsidiary, so trade payables. Then the subsidiary will be receiving from the parent, so trade uh, receivables in that case. Ideally, at the end of the day, we expect this account to be the same. 
we expect these accounts to be the same. In other words, in the books of the parent entity, how much they owe the subsidiary should be the same as how much the subsidiary uh, is having in their trade receivables. But there are two reasons why um, there are two reasons why But there are two reasons why uh, something can happen for these figures not to be the same. Number one is their goods in transit. Okay, goods in transit. Now, if the subsidiary is selling to the parent and there is a goods in transit, what's going to be happening is that it means that in the books of the subsidiary, they are going to be having a higher figure for what they deem to receive from the parent than what the parent will be having in their books. So that goods in transit could become the balancing figure that we are looking at. When this happens in that particular case, but if that, the uh, thing is not in that particular case, then what happens is that we are going to be deducting how much is available in the books of the subsidiary for trade receivables? And then we will deduct how much is available in the books of the parent entity. Then, like I told you earlier, the goods in transit will be debited to the inventory account. So, ideally, we expect the figures to be the same. But sometimes the figures will not be the same. So, if you are doing the consolidated financial statement, when you write trade receivables, you bring the parent figure, the subsidiary figure, then you deduct the amounts that the, uh, is outstanding there from the sub in that case. Then when you write trade payable, the same thing you do there. Then you uh, deduct the parent figure in that particular case. Then when you come to inventory, you bring the parent, add the sub, then you add the goods in transit. I get in it. Then you add the goods in transit. So we are assuming that the parent is buying from the subsidiary. So in the parent books, they have trade payables. In the subsidiary books, they will have trade receivables. Ideally, how much I owe you should be how much you uh, have in your books as receivable from me. But sometimes the figures will be different. The subsidiary may be having in their books 5,000. Whilst the parent is having in their books 2,000. So whilst the parent think they owe the subsidiary 2,000, the subsidiary said parent owes them 5,000. We are saying that why sh that will that discrepancy be there? This discrepancy will be there because of goods in transit, number one. The goods in transit is because the subsidiary might have sent some goods to the parent, but the parent might have not received the goods uh, until after the accounting period. For that reason, those goods have not been accounted for or recorded, hence not part of their trade payables. For that reason, I'm saying that if you are doing the consolidated financial statement, if you write trade receivables, you bring the parent figure, you bring the subsidiary's figure, then you less the reconciliation account. In, the, in my illustration, 5000 if you write trade payables, you bring the parent figure, the subsidiary's figure, then you bring the trade payable, 2000 Then with the goods in transit, whatever value of the goods in transit, you push it into the books. But remember, like I told you, if there is goods in transit, there will be provision for realized profit on that so that you deduct any PUP from that particular part. That is the idea about the first reason why this discrepancy could be there. Another reason why this discrepancy could also be there is also about cash in transit. C-I-T, cash in transit. Probably the reason why the parent is having 2,000, but the subsidiary is still having 5,000 is because the parent entity has wired some check or paid some money, but the subsidiary had not received that money until after the reporting date. For that reason, the cash in transit will be recorded in the books of the person supposed to receive it. In which case, the same rule is going to be applying. But what is going to be happening is that when there is cash in transit, when we write cash, we bring the parent, we bring the sub, then we'll add any cash in transit 
in that particular case. This is how we reconcile the current account between the parent entity and the subsidiary entity. Any questions, please? Any questions? I see somebody, Osmanu, screaming in the chat saying, network, oh, network. Uh, is that from your end, I guess? Because, you know, my network, it's okay. It's a bit stable, so I guess that's okay. Samuel Kuria said, Hi, Inshira, I missed on Goodwill. Can you just give an overview? Oh, you, can, you have to watch the video. You can watch the part three video on Goodwill, and you understand everything in that case, because it's a whole discussion on its own. So you can watch the part three video yesterday. You can check it on the description and watch it. Osmanu said, please, I have a question, which is not about intra-group, but I will ask at the end of the lesson. Uh, you can bring it up in that case. You can bring the question up since it relates to consolidation. If it is not something that we have covered already, then I'll share my thought on it. Ole. Oled said, uh, kindly take the reconciliation again, because I, I think I just did that. I saw your message, so I did that. So I hope that it makes sense for you. Let me know if there are any other questions. That is about the reconciliation of the current accounts. The reconciliation of the current accounts. The reconciliation of the current account. So... When it comes to intra-group trading, these are the things that we need to understand. You need to note if there is inventory, how do we treat it? If there is an asset that has been sold, how is it going to be treated? Then also, if there is a current account, which almost always will be there, since there are trading occurring, how much do we deduct from the consolidated financial statement when dealing with trade receivables and then trade payables when dealing with trade receivables and trade payables now once you deal with intra-group trading then you are just at the tail end of your discussion okay by now you have done all the things that you are supposed to do you have read all the footnotes that you are supposed to read so you prepare the consolidated retained earnings or the group retained earnings. So the consolidated retained earnings or the group retained earnings. So when it comes to the group retained earnings, this is where you are bringing the double entry of everything that we've said already. So you bring the parents profit or the parents retained earnings. That will be brought. Then we'll bring share of Post acquisition profit or loss. Now remember, if there is an associate, we will bring it up. If it's a profit, you add. If it is a loss, you deduct. Then from the subsidiary, our share of their profit will also come. If it is profit, you add. If it is a loss, you deduct in that case. Then if there is any impairment, you're going to be bringing it up. Remember, I told you two things about impairment. Impairment in associates, if there is anything like that, it's going to be deducted. Then impairment in goodwill, the parent share, if NCI is valued at fair value, will be brought. Then what is going to happen is that if there is any provision for unrealized profit, this is if the parent is the one selling. If it happens that the parent is the one selling, then certainly provision for unrealized profit would have to come in the group retained earnings in that particular case. In that particular case. So that is also another item that will have to be there. And uh, there could be other items, any other item that affects. Uh, the movement in retained earnings or the profit of the parent entity is going to be coming in there. Remember, there, there will be finance costs. The unwinding of the finance costs, if there is contingent uh, consideration or 
uh, how do we call it? Uh, you discount that pre present value. So we spoke about this earlier, deferred consideration. So there could be finance cost. There could be two finance costs, actually. Maybe let me put it that way. Finance costs relating to unwinding of deferred consideration. Okay. Then there could be finance costs if there was issue of loan notes to finance the acquisition. Remember I told you about all these uh, in the beginning when we're looking at the net assets of the subsidiary and dealing with the goodwill situation coming in. So whatever uh, that is going to affect the parent's profit is actually going to be brought here in that particular case. It's actually going to be brought here. So basically that is the consolidated retained earnings or the group retained earnings. And that is the closing figure that goes to the statement of financial position. That's the closing figure that goes to the statement of financial position. Let me know if there are any questions for me real quick. Let me know if there are any questions for me real quick. Then the last thing will be NCI at the reporting date. NCI at the reporting date. Now, with the NCI at the reporting date, you bring your NCI at acquisition, what you use to calculate the goodwill. Then you bring the share of post acquisition profit or loss from the SAP. Profit or loss from the SAP. If it's profit, you add. If it's a loss, you're going to deduct it in that particular case. Then, if NCI is value at fair value, then their share of impairment will come in, assuming that if uh, we don't take it into consideration in the net asset schedule, then we'll bring it here. So, impairment in goodwill. Remember, I taught you in the beginning that there are two ways that impairment in goodwill will be treated. Either you come and deduct it individually from the NCI and then the CI, or you deduct it in the determination of the post-acquisition profit. So it depends on whichever uh, way you want to do it, but it doesn't have to come twice. Got to be careful that you are not deducting the figure twice, because if you are deducting the figure twice, you're going to be in trouble at the end of the day. You're going to be in trouble at the end of the day. So that impairment will be deducted, and probably that could be all. And that gives us the NCI at the reporting date. That goes to the face of the statement of financial position. That goes to the face of the statement of financial position. So that is the idea about that. See some comments coming in. Let me see if I can look at them. Let's see. Okay, group retain earnings. I just spoke about that. Do we have something we call deconsole? If yes, how do how do go about it? I think so. Looking at the last sitting paper. It's it's not about deconsolidation. Um, yes, we can use the word deconsolidation, though, but the context is if you lose control of the company at the end of the day. Because, you know, you can only consolidate if you control the company. So if you lose control of the company, then certainly you cannot what consolidate at the end of the day. So looking at the last semester's uh, question as you are bringing it up, I'm looking at it. Tafo purchased 10 million, 
80% of the shares. Safo agreed to settle the consideration in two unconditional installments, da 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 da, on February, da da da. For several years, Safo held 20% equity in this. Uh, the sale from Brazil. Uh, at 31st December, it was concluded that 5% of good was invested. Assume that all necessary consolidation adjustment uh, included in the above consolidated statement of comprehensive income, calculate goodwill, prepare the statement of profit or loss of Ibrahim for the year ended 2020, show an analysis of consolidated profit statement and total comprehensive income attributable to NCI and the parent equity shareholders. So we will. Stop consolidating a firm if there is a loss of ownership. I've not gone through the details of this question, but I think I'll look at it and then look at the details of this question. Then I'll share thoughts on it. Probably on Monday, if we meet on the live stream and I'm doing something corporate reporting related in that case. But the issue is that once an entity loses uh, its control of the firm, then they have no rights to consolidate their information so we will have to take out their information and most importantly, focus on only what relates to the period under consideration in that particular case or what relates to the. So there is something like that. Once we lose control, then we can no longer add their revenue to our revenue, their asset to our asset. We will subtract their revenue from the consolidated financial statement as given to us. Then what is going to happen is that only a portion of the revenue that relates to, or only the portion of their profit that relates to the period from the beginning of the year to the time we lost control will be included in our statement of profit or loss, in which case we will not have to prepare consolidated financial statements. So, like I said, I'll share my thought on this uh, later on, possibly on Monday, to give you the context of the question. But the idea is, once you lose control, you cannot consolidate the financial statement of the entity. What is the treatment of loan interest from a loan, say, given to the subsidiary? Loans given to subsidiary, as a, as a single entity, they are not supposed to owe anybody. So if a loan is given to the subsidiary, at the end of the day, it has to be cancelled. So whilst it will be included in the parent company, in the parent books, and the non-current uh, assets as equity instruments, probably as equity instruments and the non-current assets, it will be in the subsidiaries books as non-current liability. So when we are, we are consolidating, parents cannot owe the sub, the sub cannot owe the parents, so any loan outstanding between them will be taken out. So loans given... Uh, from the parent to the sub will be cancelled out in the books of the company because nobody is supposed to owe somebody on the consolidated level because we are one. Okay, the two shall be one. So let's say I'm talking about my wife and I, uh, sh she takes some money from me and she's like, honey, I'm going to give you that probably later on. Then I'm like, I mean, I can't say she owe me that kind of thing. The two shall be one. Didn't you hear that? So if you borrow money to your wife or your girlfriend or whatever it is, you can't just say, I'm collecting the money because the two shall be one. Your wife, your girlfriend there, you can take it. <laughs> so let's go. Let's see what's going on. Nicholas, please, the, the impairment of NCI, is it the subsidiary share or full amount? I don't understand your question. But if you are talking about the impairment, it is the NCI share of the impairment in goodwill that is coming. It is the NCI share. So if the impairment in goodwill is 10,000 and NCI is 25% and NCI is valued at fair value, then we'll take the 25% of the impairment. That will be the impairment figure that will come in the NCI for the reporting date. Does it make sense, Nicholas? Let me know if you get that. Godwin Honu said, uh, good evening, Shira. Good job. You are too much. Okay, thank you. Right. So, okay, Nicholas said, okay, thanks. You're welcome. Right. So when it comes to consolidated financial statement, basically, these are the general principles that you need to understand. Now, now that you have these general principles, now that you have the blueprints, 
you need to solve some questions in that particular case. Then you see how you can apply them, how you can apply that, apply them. Like I say all the time, it is not about how, it is not just about how many questions you solve. Because the more questions you solve, the more inadequate you feel. Okay, the more inadequate you feel because each question will come with its own thing. But if you understand the general concepts, the general principle, then you will be practicing the questions in that particular case. So that is it about consolidated financial statements. And thank you guys for joining us on the live stream throughout the week. And it's really, really uh, a pleasure for me to be able to provide you with a blueprint on uh, some of these key topics as you go into the exams. Now, for those of you who are not aware, we did a three-part series on interpretation of financial statement. That is also another done deal area in the exam hall. In case you missed that, you can check the description of this video on YouTube and watch the part one, the part two, the part three on ratios and interpretation of ratios where I gave the blueprints on how you interpret the various ratios. It's a done deal area. Make sure you watch that video. Make sure you understand it. Make sure you practice a lot of questions. Then, uh, when it comes to dealing with a consolidated financial statement also, we've gone through some of them and we will see how uh, this principle actually apply uh, in that case. So I'm seeing a comment coming in. Nicola said, please, uh, will I think you're asking if I'll take you through a question. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Possibly on Monday, we could uh, take a question about that. But what we're going to do is that uh, with that question, uh, it, will be, it will be on Zoom so that I will let some of you guys join us live on Zoom. And in that case, we'll be streaming uh, just on YouTube. Then uh, you can join me on the Zoom call live so that you get access to the question. You speak to me directly, and then we see how it goes. So yes, uh, I I'm seeing Monday, hopefully, we can uh, have a session where we are solving a question on consolidated financial statements, and it will be a Zoom call. Uh, in that case, you can join in there and then get access to the questions, speak with me directly. Then if there are any other questions that you have also relating to these things, you will be able to get them up in that case. So Nicholas, definitely uh, Monday we will see if we can have uh, the practice question on consolidation in that case. So let's see how it goes. Follow me on Instagram. Details on that will be posted on my Instagram. If it happens that uh, we will host you guys on Zoom, then the Zoom ID and the password will all be posted on my Instagram page so that you can get the notice and join. In that case, we will just be streaming on YouTube uh, because uh, I will not be we could do the third party and then do the streaming on Facebook and YouTube at the same time through Zoom. But uh, I would just want to stream on one platform when we are on Zoom in that case. Okay, you are welcome. So just follow me on uh, Instagram and uh, make sure you click the notification bell so that when I post, you will get a notification as well so you can join. So that will be it about that. So thank you very much. It's been a great and fruitful week so far as we continue with our discussion towards the IC in November 2021 examination. Next week, God willing, we're going to be uh, heading into something else. Definitely not about financial reporting. You know, after the Monday, when we solve the question on consolidation, possibly I will look at another topic in another subject because we have some topics as well coming up about uh, limiting factor analysis, about uh corporate restructuring financial reorganization da, 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 da. so we'll look at all that we'll look at all that someone is asking on my instagram my my handle is insura premium just the same name on the channel that just the same name on instagram is the same thing the same name on instagram hi uh isa Havi say hi Please, have you tackled complex group? Yeah, we spoke about a concept of calculation of uh, dealing with complex group uh, earlier in the discussion in that case. The only issue about complex group here will be the issue about if we are dealing with, say, a foreign subsidiary or we are dealing with uh, stage uh, acquisition. Uh, in that case, what are the various workings that we look at? And those are specific issues that uh, possibly later on we will talk about them if we have more time on our clock by then. Okay, Andrew uh, said, thank you, Shira. 
always a pleasure. And thank you guys for thank you guys for joining us. And uh, really, it's something that uh, I'm excited about and coming your way every time. So make sure that you continue to study, you continue to work hard. Remember, we have eight weeks more to go. Funny enough, today is the eighth weeks that eighth week that we have done so far. And we are in the middle. We have 16 weeks. We started our class uh, and we are in the eighth week. So we have eight more weeks to go for the ICA November 2021 examination. And I hope that you guys are working hard, learning. And let's see how it goes. And let's see what we do in that case. So enjoy the rest of your weekend, which has already started, literally, though. But have a great weekend. And I'll catch you same time next week at 4.30 p.m. as we continue with our discussion. Remember, follow me on Instagram at Ishira Premium and stay connected. Bye-bye.